All right, great evening. This is Bishop Wade. I am so thrilled and delighted to be with you again. Uh, welcome back to Sunday Night Live. We're taking some time out to uh, share and investigate great leaders. And I'm just gonna be honest with you, y'all know me. I am so thrilled to have um, uh, my dear friend, Dr. Reginald Garman with us uh, all the way from Atlanta. Um, you know, he asked me early, he says, well, you know, what are the topics? And I, I just shared with him, I said, look, I, I gave him a few things, but we have always worked so well together. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I wrote something and it was just, just, just a few minutes ago, I just sat down and I said, what, when I think of Reginald, what comes to mind? So Dr. Garman, uh, and he'll share his church and all that. I just want to talk about him. He's a man of humility. I wrote this down. Humility. He's level-headed and balanced. He's anointed, strategic, and he's a family man. And y'all know I'm all about family. And so, I, Dr. Garmin, it's, such, it's a thrill and a joy to have you. I'm so glad you're with me. Say hey to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> hello, 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 um, Bishop. Thank you so much, first of all, um, for, for having me here tonight on this platform. Um, thank you for being such a leader in the body of Christ. Um, thank you um, for the wonderful work that you're doing, um, leaders, training leaders. Um, but mostly, thank you for being such a great friend and a brother. Um, I appreciate you. And, you know, I absolutely love your wife, Elder Marie. Uh, that's my sister. So I, I'm just blessed and delighted just to be able to share in this platform with you tonight. It's, it's truly an honor. I, I, I feel like um, I'm a uh, mosquito um, in the midst of a huge pond. It's just just so much wealth of wisdom that you have. And um, I'm just, uh, I just want to gleam and pull from it. Y'all don't fall for that. Don't fall for that. <laughs> <laughs> Do not fall for that. Don't fall for that. Oh. Uh, look, Dr. Gar, you said it you want to. I'm a, let me tell the truth. We, we were, we, a few years ago, we were having some kind of conference or something, but you were in town in, in Panama City uh -huh. And we were in my vehicle, and I think we were at the we were at a condo, and the officer said, uh, "We don't want nobody like parking here." And you, I was like, "Ain't nothing wrong with this park, you know." I'm just being me, and and you just tell me, say, "Bishop, Bishop, Bishop, you just Bishop." <laughs> do you remember that? <laughs> do you I do remember, remember that. I do. You you said Bishop. Look, it, the, it, they just like my wife. He said, "Bishop, just um, it's okay. It's, it's okay. okay. Let's just let's just follow. <laughs> let's just follow." And I just calm no down. I just <laughs> think get on my nerves. <laughs> oh, that's so true. But, you know, and, and I think that's why God put us here to uh, to bring a balance and a calmness to situations. So, no, to me great. to keep. <laughs> I was just going to say the situation. I, I was not going to direct it towards you, but yeah, uh, maybe, maybe that's why I'm in your life. Praise God. <laughs> yes, that's one of many. But uh, y'all, I was like, I think I, I was teasing with my wife. I said, I was reading the fruits of the spirit and I'm like, I don't think I have all them fruits yet. I think all, I may have one. I'm working on them. I'm working on them. So, but man, I'm so happy. I am so happy to have you. And there are many pastors that are watching and ministers and elders and deacons. And um, we're just thrilled to have you. And one of the things that, uh, Reginald, I wanted to do was I wanted to uh, deal with seven principles. Mm -hmm. And as most people know, I've just built my entire life on these seven principles. But I've been fascinated to investigate how others have done it. Oh, oh, don't move, don't move. It's right here, but I had to get it. Um, it came in today. Oh, wow. <laughs> Wait, it came in about, what, third, we, we got home late. 30 minutes ago. It just got in. Wow. And look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Wow. Oh my God. The oh book is God. in with colored pictures. Thank you. With colored pictures. There are colored pictures in there somewhere. Anyway, there you go. I just. I love it. I love it. I Come love on. It. 
All right, so I'm expecting my copy this week. <laughs> this week, I need my copy. <laughs> I know. I know. We're thrilled. She just hugged me, got all emotional. I'm just so thrilled. And um, mm. one of the things that I share with our congregation today is that whenever you encounter an attack or a tough time, uh, I wrote mm. the book so Marie could read it. But I wrote it for another reason, because I wanted people to see that, you know, serving God and building your life on seven basic principles, you can survive anything and you can come out and you can live again and you can be restored and be revived and and really just just be the person who God has called you to be. And so that's why I'm thrilled that you're here. And so uh, I guess people are texting all over the place. I'm I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled. And so we're here because I want you to share uh, some of your principles and we're going to go through all seven. I have another staff, a group back there. They're typing in what you're saying and they're responding to people and we're mm -hmm. taking questions at the end. So the first pillar, the first yeah. pillar, uh, there's seven. And the first is God devotion. Tell us uh, about your um, how you spend time with God and how you hear from God. Share with us and tell us what, what you do. And, and by the way, Dr. Garman is the pastor of a phenomenal church. A phenomenal church. I go there. If I go to Atlanta, I'm joining your church. I'm telling everybody. <laughs> I go to Atlanta, I'm joining Dr. Garmin Church. What? So go ahead. Oh, all right. Bishop, how much time do we have tonight? Because you know we can talk all night. How, how much time do we have tonight? <laughs> I just need to know because we got seven principles that we need to cover. So no, we will figure it out. We hey, look, we go, you just take your time. And if we we'll just had to do a part two down the road around the corner, you just take your time, whatever. <laughs> I want you to bless us, whatever you Amen. got. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, personal devotion, as we all know, I think is critical. Um, I, I was raised in the church. I, I've been in church all my life. My mother made sure that I went to church, but I knew I had to know God and not just know of God. Um, I needed to know him for myself. Yes. Um, I knew him through my mother, or of course, through my pastor, but I needed to know him through myself. So just having an experience with God, uh, when I first decided that I was not just going to be um, just a church member, but I wanted a personal relationship with God, one of the first things God told me, he wanted me to spend time with him in prayer early in the morning. And that time in prayer, I remember Bishop going in my closet. I put a chair in my closet because a, a prophet came to church and the prophet said, I, I see a, a door, a mirrored door. And I see you spending time with God behind this mirrored door. Wow. He He's never been to my home, but my, my closet door, sliding doors, they were mirrors. And so I knew immediately when he said that, that that was God calling me in literally into the closet. I, so I put a chair in my closet and just spent Good God. time with God in prayer. My, my, my devotional life started with prayer. And then when I started pastoring, I realized that we should speak with God before we speak for God. Is is it's important that we speak with God mm. um, before we speak for God. So many times we, we call ourselves speaking um, for God, but we have not spoken to God. So I, I endeavored to make sure that I had a personal relationship. You know, the, the Bible says, Paul said to Timothy, show yourself approved unto God. Yes. Not show yourself approved unto man, but show yourself approved unto God. So not only my prayer life, but my study, I had to make sure that I study to live and not just study to preach. Mm. Um, because some people study for a sermon, but I think a sermon should come out of your life yes. to be able to see yourself and see others in scripture, in the word. So I wanted to study to show myself approved. If I'm approved, then I can speak about his word to bring approval in the lives of others. So mm. I always study to live before I study to preach. 
um, because I must be the first student of that word. So prayer, study, making sure that I seek him first and everything that I do, spend quality. I love my family. I love golf. We're probably going to talk about that a little bit later on. I love a lot of things, but God wants to be first and foremost in my life. So I, I made room for him. And and when we make room for him, he comes in and he makes us a, a holy habitation before him. I, yes. I don't want to just have a visitation from God. I want a holy habitation of God. And in order for that to happen, we got to make room for him and set aside. You know, when I go out on, on a date with my wife, uh, she doesn't like to wait long. So I have to make sure I make reservations. Yes. So the reservations lets the restaurant know that we're going to be here at this time and we expect to get our seat when we arrive. So I, I decided if I can make reservations for a, a date with my wife, surely uh -huh. I can make reservations for God in my life. We put everything else on our calendar. And if you don't schedule it, sometimes you'll never do it. So we make reservations with God to spend time with God, to sit down and sup with him yes. as, we, um, as we do with others. So that's, that's my basically my personal devotion life is just making sure that I reserve time for him, special time for him in the morning, seeking him first, study to live instead of studying to preach. Yes. And to make sure I speak with God before I speak for God. Man, I'm going to tell you, you, you right. I, I don't know how much time we got, but that's deep. You know, so so basically when you make the bread, you eat what you serve. You ain't just serving it. You, this is this is this. You just giving us some of what you're dining off of. It, it's a part of your diet. Yes. Yes. And, and people should be blessed in the overflow. Yes. You know, if, if it doesn't bless you, how is it going to bless others? If it doesn't speak to you, how is it going to speak to others? And having that. And I'm I'm sure that people can recognize a, a gift from an anointing. Mm. I think an anointing only comes when you're spending time with the father. Come on. Uh, when you when you have a sincere devotion like there are many people and many preachers and many leaders that that know the word of God, but has the word become flesh and dwelt among them full of grace and truth. So I, I want the word to come alive in me because it is then fed to others in a different way. I always like warm bread. You know, Bishop, I'm a bread lover. You know, <laughs> Olive, Olive Garden. Olive Garden. Uh, Oh, um, red lobster, whatever bread, bread is. And, um, bread. <laughs> I love bread. But uh, you know what? Red, red lobster biscuits. Oh, my God, Jesus. That's, that's God all up in red lobster. That is God up in red lobster <laughs> right there. But, but it makes it even better when it's hot. Uh, oh, my goodness. When it's hot bread. Yes. Then it is just a different story. So we, we want it to be burning in us. Something that you uh, are passionate about, it is easy to communicate to others. If it doesn't burn in you, how is it going to burn for other people? Um, I believe it was Smith Wigglesworth says, I set myself on fire and people come to see me burn. Yes. And that's important for us to be on fire through our personal time with him, because we can become so busy serving the people that we don't have time to spend time with God. Never confuse your worship with your work and never wow. replace your worship with your work. Slow down. They typing too fast. Like I hear them clicking. <laughs> they just clicking and I'm looking at everything they post. They clicking and typing. Uh, say that never, again. Never. Never confuse your worship with your work and never substitute your worship for work. Because a lot of times we work in ministry, wow. but we lack that true worship with the Father. Yeah. Uh, so I want to make sure that I separate the two or I find myself um, just working for God and not worshiping the only true God.
That is so powerful. I had wrote a question down here earlier. I said, is it more important to be with God or to hear from God? Um, mm. I don't really know if I'm, I'm not necessarily asking you that question, but it was just, it dropped in my spirit. Is it more important to be with God or to hear from God? What do you think? It, I, we want to, you know, we want to do, we want both, but which yeah. is more important to be with him or to hear him? I, I think to be with him is, is far more important than to hear from him. Um, to be with him, I, I think when you're around somebody, it's almost like your wife, you know your wife. Yes. And if you can just get in her presence, she doesn't have to say a word and she can communicate with you and let you know that I'm happy or I'm sad, I'm pleased or I'm displeased. Just from the presence, yes. you know something about the presence. In his presence, there's fullness of joy. Come just, on the presence, just the presence. Um, and, and if he choose to say something to you during that time, that there, there's something that is, um, uh, you know, my, my mentor, my spiritual father always told us that more is caught yes. than it's taught. Just being around it. Um, you can, you can catch somebody's spirit, um, more than what they will speak out of their words. More is called than is taught. So I think the presence is more important than the words. I agree. I, I absolutely agree. Uh, and then finally, is there a method of your prayer? Normally when I pray, I have two or three methods. Uh, one mm -hmm. pastor last week said he pray in lanes, pray for the family one day, and he has mm -hmm. different lanes. Uh, I do ACTS, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication mm -hmm. and then on the end i listen so mm -hmm. that's that's part of my regimen uh do you have a particular way that you when you when you're with god what's your method yeah you know i, I read larry lee's book um years ago um as far as him breaking down the lord's prayer um our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name so i start out with adoration and yes. just letting God know who he is, that kingdom come, mm -hmm. that will be done. I, I pray for the kingdom of God um, to come in families, in our society. So I basically go through the Lord's prayer and pray those things um, during my prayer time, um, because that sort of gives me a a, a pattern. And I'm, and I'm very um, organized in my thought process. Um, I was a mechanical engineer, so I, I'm very mechanical in how yeah. I approach things. Um, so reading Larry Lee's book was um, was very helpful in understanding the process, um, even in prayer. That is so good. All right, yeah. we got to keep moving. So yeah. pillar number two, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> health. Mm. Tell us about uh, your health journey. And here's the surprise I told you I had for you. So do you recognize this? <laughs> I do. <laughs> That's awesome. That is awesome. Okay. You know, this is, I think, you know, I run all these Spartans now, but yep. I went back and I have a wall where I have all of my medallions, but this one is the first. This is the very first race wow. I've yeah. actually participated in and uh, it was with you. So yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you were kind of the genesis of me running uh, Spartans. I kind of evolved. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, glad that I started that whole journey. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have evolved. You've definitely evolved and you have eclipsed. Oh, come on. More than what I could do. So uh, health wise, yes. I, um, I, I think my, my, my health goals are to exercise at least four times a week. Um, okay. 30 minutes, 30 minutes of exercise at least four times a week. That can include um, golfing, walking on the golf course, um, outside jogging, um, cycling. I may do 20, 30 miles of cycling. And um, that's how I get my exercise in to to keep moving, 
that's my weekly regimen um, of how I can make sure that I stay healthy so that I can fulfill God's purpose in the earth. Um, another health goal of mine is to get at least seven hours of sleep every day. People Excellent. don't realize how important sleep is. So I, I have a shutoff time where I make sure that I get my rest. I don't stay up, you know, real, real late at night, especially if I know that I have something to do in the morning. Um, drinking water. Um, I drink at least 64 ounces of water a day. That's something Excellent. that I try to incorporate. And as far as my diet, I, I just, my, my theory is moderation. Okay. So um, there are things that I do in moderation. I don't think I should go overboard. Um, as you said in the beginning, I'm a very balanced person. I, I try to eat a balanced diet. So <laughs> not too much bread, but a little bread. And, um, and so that's, that's what I do. Cut down on my carbs, cut down on my sugars. Uh, and you lost some weight. Yes, I have. I have. And that's, Tell us about it. That's, um, well, you know, I just, I wanted to be more disciplined in my, in my diet. So I cut out a lot of um, carbs and, and probably about half the carbs I eat now than I did before. And just being a little bit more diligent as far as my exercise, making sure I set time um, to exercise. So that has worked very well for me. Um, especially during the spring and the summer when I'm able to get outside and really become more active. So I have to be a little bit more um, diligent during the winter right. and make sure I go downstairs and get on the treadmill or make sure I continue to stay active during the winter months. So it has been a journey for me. Um, it has not been easy, but with anything, it's just going to take effort. Well, I think you're doing good. I remember the days. I remember the days. So I think you're doing good. What is your uh -huh. strong, what is your toughest struggle? Mine is cookies. So I, I got to tell you real quick, I'm not trying yeah. to be Superman. I struggle with cookies. I like, I, confession is good for the soul. I like Oreo cookies. I like uh, Chip Ahoy. I like Lorna Dunes. And I could go on and on. I love a good cookie. And, I'll, I'll, and I love hot tamales. So... <laughs> I'm just, I feel bad for people on drugs because I'm fighting cookies. I'm just fighting cookies. Ooh. And it's usually in the evening. I get, I get attacked by the cookie demon, the cookie monster. <laughs> I just, and I love them. And I have to like, you know, it's, we said Sundays is kind of, will be a day where we could just kind of spoil ourselves and we're out with friends. But it's tough for me. What's your toughest uh, struggle? Uh, my toughest struggle is bread. Oh my goodness. Oh, it bread, is bread. Okay. <laughs> bread is my toughest struggle. Uh, my, my second toughest is chocolate chip cookies. Oh, I love a good chocolate chip cookie. Talk to me. Talk to Ooh, me. Oh my goodness. It's, it, that's, that was just God's creation right there. He created, on the eighth day, He created chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> <laughs> So that that's just that's just a struggle, but but I try to I try to do that in moderation, Bishop. Yes. But bread is my biggest. I love I absolutely love bread. Fresh so bread. smells so good. Bread. Oh my God, I love bread. But um, I love some sweets too. I love a good chocolate chip cookie. Excellent, excellent. So mm -hmm. so you're on the health journey and uh, improving so much. So here is the next topic, which is one of my yeah. loves. One of the pillars is personal growth. So mm -hmm. I, I marked here and I usually like to write and uh, I, I come up with some of my own quotes. And so here I wrote uh, personal growth. Improving yourself is the first step in improving everything else. Uh, everything good. rises and falls with leadership. John Maxwell. Uh, mm -hmm. I think Gandhi said, be the change you want to see. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm very much committed to helping other leaders grow. But what I think is important is to have a personal growth plan, um, a personal growth regimen. And uh, so share with us, what are your top three things that you do to grow personally and with some other pastors and other leaders. I'm looking at all these people who are on the line right now. Uh, those who are looking, what are some of the things that you do that have, that have helped you to grow? What would you recommend? Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and, and before I answer that, Bishop, let, let me just go back to health because I think this is a very important thing. And this is actually something that you inspired me to do. Um, 
once a year, I do a physical with my doctor. I think you need to have a physical, but you inspired me to at least go get my blood work done um, every six months. So I know where my numbers are. Yes. So a lot of times we don't go to the doctor. We don't know where we are. We don't know where our numbers are. Yes. And I think that's so important for health. Now, personal growth. So that, that was something that I learned that helped me to grow personally. And, and so my, my first thing is I surround myself with people that are wiser than myself. Mm. You know, I believe when you surround your people with wise men and wise women um, and you endeavor to spend time with them. So my, my goal is to at least once a week have a conversation with someone that I can glean from. I can glean from. And so just calling that person and we share things with them, that helps me to grow. Um, take them out to lunch. Sometimes I take them out to lunch just to sit down and be able to glean from these wise women and men of God That's so it. that I can personally grow. If you're the smartest person in the room, the room is too small. Ah, okay. If you're the smartest person in the room, the mm -hmm. room is too small. So you, you have to get around people that will stretch you, that will put your life in tension. Every bit of growth comes from tension. If you want to grow muscles, you got to put your muscles in tension. You've got to surround yourself with people that are not just drunk on your success or drunk on your anointing, but people that can put your life in tension My and that will stress you. So I look for those people because those people make you uncomfortable. Those people challenge you, those people. So I, I have some people such as yourself that will challenge me to say, hey, uh, Dr. Gum, you need to stop drinking milk, okay? So you came and told me about some pulse in milk. That challenged me. Milk has <laughs> pulse. <laughs> yes, yes, that challenged me. So now I'm on almond milk. I can't tell you when I've had regular milk before. But if it wasn't for that challenge yes. and that tension that you put me under, um, I would not have grown. So personal growth has everything to do with relationships. Y yes, yes, yes. Finding those relationships, honoring those relationships, spending time, whether it's on the phone, whether it's going to lunch. I cannot tell you how much I've grown just through the relationships in my life. That's the first thing. The second thing is I continue to take classes. I, I have three degrees, but I'm continuing to learn and take classes. Yes. And, and I think that's the only way that I'm going to grow because um, the room of improvement is the biggest room that you can ever be in. So I want to make sure that I continue to learn. Wait, 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 wait. Say that again. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> the, the, the room of improvement is the biggest room you can be in. The room of improvement. So we, we all can improve in some way. Wow. Okay. And so we must be um, in wow. this room where that we can grow and that we can improve. Um, I have not arrived, even though I have three degrees, I have not arrived. I'm continuing to learn and to grow and to take classes and to go to seminars and to go to conferences. And I think that's how we continue to grow as a person. And the third thing is leaders are readers. Leaders are readers. And so the books that you read, there, there are three things that change your life the experiences you have, the people you meet, and the books that you read. Those three <laughs> things would change your life. The experiences that you have, the people you meet, and the books that you read. Those three things. My, my. So um, I'm always interested and I get recommendations because I'm, I'm just not a natural lover of reading. I'm yeah. not. I read because I have a passion and desire for growth. So now we got all of your books and I love that. That was that. That's what God created on the ninth day. He created <laughs> all of your books. <laughs> on the eighth day, he created chocolate chip cookies. On the ninth day, he created all of your cookies. Why you listen to Audible and drink almond milk. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh yes, yes. So, so as you're driving, I, I have a 30 minute commute to um, to the office. So as I'm driving to the office, I'm I'm playing audio books in the car, and I'm growing as I'm driving. And and so those are the three things that that I do in order for my personal growth to continue. Well, it's like you're in school. You're you're constantly learning. I think a lot of people when they finish their academic education and get their yeah. degree, they stop learning. They stop growing. And anything that does not grow, it dies. I mean, anything of true value has to continue to grow. And yeah. I think yeah. I think that may be the true essence of life is growth. Heaven, we want to go to heaven, but if heaven was really the the end all, we would just get saved and then die and go to heaven. There's a work to do here, and in order to do it, we have to create capacity and right. have the ability, give God something he can work with. I think that's exactly. a good way to say it. I love this because you know, I've I've been I've gotten into audibles lately. I love reading, and uh, mm -hmm. I have a love-hate relationship with reading. But uh, particularly if I'm reading something I'm interested in, but audibles have really been a, a huge thing for me in the past year or two. I just pop on an audible and podcasts. Podcasts mm -hmm. are amazing because you get real time information of what's going on in the society at that time. So yes. I love the I love the audibles. I got too many. And but I found podcasts are also connected and many of those podcasts are free. Exactly. Exactly. And it's, it's concentrated, too. So you get a lot of information in a short period of time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love the book reading. I, I wrote this down. Stay uncomfortable <clears throat> so the people you love can be comfortable. Oh, that's good. Maria that's good. and I that's... We were in the car and she was like, yeah. Look, say that again. Say that again, bitch. Say that again. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I say it is important that I stay uncomfortable so that the people around me can be comfortable, but they cannot just allow me to think that way. Anyone in a growing relationship, in a relationship that is uh, prosperous and developing and, and has that, that growth sensation, each person must adopt that same philosophy. So I, have, I was mm -hmm. teasing with her about marriage. I said, there are things I do in our marriage that it makes me uncomfortable. I mean, some days I don't maybe want to cut the yard, but I know how much you like me in my shorts when I cut the yard. She likes to see me in my shorts when I cut the yard. So I'm a little uncomfortable on a hot day, but I do it because it makes the one I love comfortable. Right, but right. with her, she does things around the house. Maybe she washed the dishes. She don't want to wash my dish that day, but she mm -hmm. does it and it may be a little uncomfortable compared to other things. But because mm -hmm. she's uncomfortable, it makes everyone around her comfortable. And that's how you create a, a phenomenal relationship because everyone around each other is saying, okay, I'm going to be a little uncomfortable because if I do, then I'm going to create comfort for those around me. That's good. That's good, Bishop. Yes. And, and, and God takes us um, to different levels. So he will bring us to a level of comfort, makes us uncomfortable just to bring us to a higher level of comfort. So you, I don't think we'll ever achieve that place where we're just comfortable, okay? We shouldn't, we shouldn't. Cause he will come and disturb our comfort to make us uncomfortable. Come on. So that we can achieve a higher level of comfort. And that's why no matter how long you've been married, you're growing. No matter how long you've been pastoring, you're yes, growing. You're growing. Um, there's a different level of comfort to achieve. I love that. I love that. I, I, I think most leaders have to have a growth mentality. You had mentioned three growth principles. Uh, I think another one is skills that we learn, learning new skills. Like mm -hmm. I've been talking to some people who are speaking Spanish and I was like, hey, could you teach me a word every day? So I'm learning a new language. And uh, of course, with my new book, I think that maybe another way of, of learning and growing is through the things we suffer, through the things we yes. suffer. I learned yes. I've learned a lot through suffering. I, that's the one I don't want. But uh, I think there's a place of growth when yes. we suffer through something and we come out. Uh, yes. I think yes. that's a, that's another place of growth. Yes, exactly. You said something in your sermon today. Um, I, I, I 
I don't necessarily eavesdrop on your sermons. Uh, I, I, <laughs> look, boy, I love it. Let me tell you something. Social media is my thing. I I go to everybody church. Everybody church. I want to know what they're doing. And uh, and so uh, my wife is just a member of your church. I don't know if you knew that. She's a she's a she's a satellite member. Your sister is a member of your church. I see Brenda, Brenda and Lewis and Urban Jones. She's a member of Jacksonville Church, and she's a member in Texas. My wife called everybody church. They might then crack it up. My wife belongs. I see Brenda. I see you, Brenda. Uh, she's a member of your church too, Brenda. And so in the mornings, I get up and I, I'm usually hearing. I hear. I think Brenda on Thursday or Friday. She they have this talk thing. I hear them. But on mm -hmm. Sundays, I know I'm gonna hear you or one of a couple other preachers. And mm -hmm. I love what you were saying today about young people uh, uh, slowing down. You were saying mm. how we who are older in that third, you had one of the mothers to it. One of the mothers, you know, we're in the third quarter of our lives, but yeah. young people need to learn how to slow down and build the foundation. I love that. I love that because that's the essence of growth, just slow and steady. Yes, yes, Bishop. Yes, yes. You know, and, and that's just amazing to me. The, the people that have the most time, young people, they have they have the least patience, mm. you know. So they they're trying to do everything overnight, and and one thing about growth, growth are steps that you take, not an elevator that you ride. Say that again. Growth is about steps, steps. that you take, hey. not an elevator that you ride. That you ride. So yes. most of us want to ride an elevator. So they see a person get to a certain place in their life and they want to know, where can I catch that elevator? It's yeah. not an elevator. Those are steps that we took through the pain, through the suffering. Yes. Through the books that we read, through the people that we had the privilege to be able to sit down and have lunch with. Those, those are the steps that we had to take in order to get to where we are. And that takes time. Growth takes time. Anything that grows too fast is a cancer. Come on. It's a disease if it grows too fast. Infections grow fast, but healthy things grow slow and steady. So that's good stuff. We have. <laughs> that's good. That's good. You know, that I think that's one of the things that I think when I look at young people today, and it, from a growth perspective, mm -hmm. uh, it's so important that we have the right kind of models. Um, mm -hmm. Even with the college, I have different people calling me saying, you know, like they're the apostle or the chief of the. And then you do a little investigation. You go like, oh, my God. Oh, no, 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 no. You didn't just come sit down somewhere. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Uh, because it's that thing. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's that desire to say, OK. You know, I have arrived. I'm I'm 32, and I've arrived to this pinnacle. Mm -hmm. But for us, um, I'm thankful for Bishop Ellis because Bishop Ellis mm -hmm. didn't let me preach a real scripture for over three or four years. I literally yeah. had to matriculate. I was an aspiring yeah. exalter, a licensed mm -hmm. minister, a deacon, a elder. I got to preach one time, and it was like 15 minutes. It was like a group of preachers. I just mm -hmm. got lost in the midst. I thought I had a good sermon. Ain't, ain't wow. nobody say nothing. It, it, ooh, praise the Lord. And, but it was because it, it was not about the preaching but it was about the service. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. if more leaders can position themselves to serve and to say how do I best serve? Mm -hmm. when, wherever God plants you, if you have a servant's mentality uh, mm -hmm. which I think is true leadership. I think maybe the heartbeat of the you know the heartbeat of leadership uh, may be service if mm -hmm. they can find out ways to serve their community uh, and, and just lose the thought of trying to be important or maybe big and nothing right. wrong with that, but the heartbeat right. has to be right. And that's right. why I, when we come to your church, that's what I love about being there is that you can feel those around you having a desire to serve. And mm. that has been caught. And you're a mm. good teacher. You're a good preacher, too. But that has been called mm -hmm. and you can tell because it, you can you can sense the essence of that 
and people are trying to serve and 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 change mm -hmm. the community and change society and it, it mm -hmm. and it, it, it reflects in our children so uh the heartbeat has to be service i think we grow that way too do you agree oh i definitely agree i i think that shows maturity um and that's what we want to see in growth the more you are focused on others versus focusing on yourself that shows personal growth and development that's wonderful um, so as we love one another as we love others before we love ourselves as we focus on others as we serve others um jesus came in the form of a servant and and so as we humble ourselves and we become a little bit more concerned about others and what they are going through and how we can be a blessing to them i think that shows our personal growth and development um, a lot of times when you're self-centered, then that lets me know you still have some maturity to do. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I agree. And we're going to move on, but I'm going to add this to it because that growth is my thing. Um, I have what I call my daily battle plan. Mm. I have, I build a daily battle plan every day. So I know what time I'm going to be at. Like tonight, yeah, I'm going to start yawning. I, I got a little time, but I know what time I'm going to bed. I know what time I got to wake up. And in between that, I build a battle plan throughout the entire day. And that mm -hmm. really helps me stay on target. And uh, I mm -hmm. think that's powerful. All right, number number four, we're almost there. Yeah. Number four, yeah. number four is marriage. Marriage. Um, mm -hmm. I, look, that's a, is that is not that like a weak topic? I think you and I could stay here a whole week and talk about marriage. How many years have you been married now? How many 29 years? years. 29, 29 years. 29 years. Yes. And, and how many wives have you had? I mean, within that 29 year period. <laughs> oh, I, I hope Lisa didn't hear that. I, I hope wife. Lisa didn't hear that. <laughs> one wife in 29 years. You said 11 wives? You had 11 oh, wives? One, one, one wife. And she's the mother of all my children. <laughs> <laughs> That's rare. That is oh, rare. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, tell us, what's the secret sauce to marriage? And wow. y'all are happy. Y'all are happy. Yes, yes, we're happily married. You know, it, it was so funny, Bishop. I, I, I went to Egypt and I saw the great pyramids of Egypt. Yes. But what I did not realize about the great pyramids of Egypt, they also have three smaller pyramids around the big pyramid. The smaller pyramids were for the wives. Each king had three wives. And so he built a pyramid for each wife. That lets you know that even they couldn't get along in the same pyramid. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, but I, think, I think the secret to 29 years, first of all, we love each other. We're high school sweethearts. Yes. Um, we understand each other. We we appreciate each other, we accept each other, and we make sure that we um, focus on one another. And I had to learn how not to try to make my wife just like me. All right. So I had to accept who she was and who she is to this day. There's some things about my wife that has not changed in 29 years, but that's okay. That's, That's why true. I'm here. That's why I'm here. And so I'm I'm a strength in her areas of weakness and she's a strength in my areas of weakness. And we have just learned how to accept those things about one another. And it cuts down on conflict. It cuts down yes. on arguments because yes. I cannot live in a constant state of conflict. And we know um the needs of one another you know i thank god that my wife understands my unique needs and i understand hers and so that's how we serve each other why why serve me something that i don't have an appetite for hmm. so I, I need to understand the appetite of my wife so that i can serve her in those areas because if she doesn't like um, broccoli, why would I serve her broccoli? So I, I know her appetite and I show an appreciation 
for who she is and a love for who she is, and I accept her for who. So, so that's my that's my formula is to know her appetite. To know to her appetite. To know her appetite, to appreciate her, yes. and to accept her. Acceptance. Yes. Acceptance, appreciation, and understanding the appetite of my wife. And as long as I continue to feed her that love, then she's a happy cat. You know, all women are different and unique. It, yep. it, you know, and God bless people who want two or three wives. I, look, one is enough for me. I look one. I've been married 30, 38 years. They're almost thirty eight. One wow. wife is more than enough mentally, <laughs> emotionally, financially. Men are. I mean, men are pretty simple. You know, if I'm getting ready for this yeah. thing, I throw on my jacket, put my towel, put some deodorant on, brush my teeth. Yeah. I'm ready to go. Not uh, -uh. Yeah. women. They gotta get the hair done, and yeah. they gotta get the nails done. They gotta. Women just require, and every woman is unique in their own way. And I think you have to study your wife and get to know her, uh, yeah. and get a PhD. One of the things that that I have a rule, and this is just me. This is just mm -hmm. me. I don't know. You just tell me what you think. I'm a. I'm a. You my friend. So this mm -hmm. is between me and you. I'm mm -hmm. gonna share this with you. Don't tell nobody. And just yes. tell me what you think. For the most part, I I don't focus on anything negative. It, you know, if 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 we um, I, I don't complain. I mean, that may be a good way to say it. I don't I don't find myself complaining a lot about a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm just mm -hmm. I find the good. And um, sometimes now, I mean, if if my wife puts something on I really don't like, she'll know. I'll be like. But the majority of the time, if I realize she like it, it's a, I, I ain't saying that. I, I don't know if that's right or wrong. Maybe I'm not asking your opinion. I'm just, <laughs> just, I'm just, this is just me. If, if she said, John, how do you like these shoes? I just bought these shoes. First of all, you just bought them, which means you ain't buy them. You, you, you like them. So she like them. And I, I asked her, said, what do you think? She said, oh, I love them. Oh, my God. Well, I was like, well, you know, I'll find something good about them. Look, I, I, the, the color is nice. <laughs> oh wow! I you, don't do. You know, I don't do. I'm not. I'm not critical. I, maybe I got it from my dad, but I don't. She fixed me a plate of food for the most part, unless I like hot food. But as you know, like a pizza, sometimes I like my pizza extra hot. But mm -hmm, for the most mm -hmm. part, I just I'm thank you, baby. Thank you for ironing my clothes, baby. Thank you for picking the towel for me. I show, mm -hmm. baby. Thank you. I just that's, I do a lot of that. I do a lot mm -hmm. of thank you. I appreciate you. Oh, I'm just so grateful, you know. And then every now and then I'll slip or something. But I, you know, what do you think? You know, I, I think that's good. I think that's always a, a a positive thing. But when when you've been with someone for what 38 years, you you probably can say those things, but she kind of know whether you like it or not. I, I've tried that approach, Bishop, and I was like, "Yes, you know that's a pretty color." And you don't wife, say it right. Like you, that, I don't say it right. No, my wife says, looks at me okay, like you don't do like it. it. You don't like it. And uh, how do you say it? How to say what you just said? I say, you know what? That's a pretty color. <laughs> Maybe it's the lack of excitement in my voice. Maybe you that's. I, I need to work on that. That may be an area I need to work on. But but she always know when I do not like something. I, I, I don't know what it is. I, I just, I guess I don't have a good he, poker face, you know? He right. No, you right. They know us. <laughs> you right. They do know us. They do. But you know, I, I love being married. I love spending time with my, my my wife truly is my best friend. And I think that's important in marriage is to have someone that not only supports you in ministry, um, because she she definitely supports the ministry. I don't know if I can do ministry without her, but but she's truly uh, my best friend to be able to open up and and she knows everything about me. She knows my my victories and my scars. And I think that's important. And she also is there to cover me. Uh, she um, love covers. And, and I think when, when I'm, I'm hurting or when something is going on, my wife is there to cover me. And that's, that's very comforting 
um, especially when you're a leader, because sometimes you can feel all alone That's as true. a leader. And, and you need someone that is there that, that knows what you go through because you can talk to your wife about almost anything. And, and she's not going to um, use those things against you in the future. Um, I like to say this, it's important that you don't shoot your spouse with the bullets they gave you. Wow. And, um, and so I think it's wow. important because confidentiality is the hallmark of friendship. Wow. And so you got to take those things that they share with you and open up to you. And you got to put them in your heart and cover them. And that's what love does. Love covers. And so many times we don't open up to people that love us because we are afraid they're going to use it against us in the future. But it's not for um, ammunition. It is for understanding. Anything that I share with her or she shares with me is for understanding. It's not ammunition. It is not to, to, to hurt them or to win the argument. So I really do appreciate that about us in these 29 years. We, she knows more about me. I know more about her than anyone would ever know. And um, she's there to encourage me and to cover me. I love that. You know, I'm going to tell you like this. This, this, this. Here's the truth. Uh, we've done marriage retreats together. And yes. we've, had a, we've had a great time. We don't do enough. I don't know how we're going to figure this out. But it's just, you know, there's certain people you just get into a flow with. I told my wife, I said, whenever Gar and I get together, we, we you know, we, and, and, and Lisa and Marie, we like magnify. We 10x stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We just, yeah. it, it is a yeah. magnification. You got yeah. hydrogen over here and oxygen over here. We come together, boy. It's water everywhere. Yes, and, um, yes. We, just, we need to do more marriage stuff because I'm telling you, I, I, I almost gave up on doing marriage retreats because it used to be where people would come and they want to just complain and throw off on their spouses. And I told my wife, I said, forget it. I'm taking them all on a six mile Spartan run through the mud. We're going to make them jump over stuff. And the wife stuck on the wall, can't get off. And the husband got to figure out how to help her and help himself. And I ain't doing nothing but looking at her. Yeah. Get her, catch her. Here she come. <laughs> Here she come, and make her climb the rope. And you, you know, she can't climb the rope. So now he got to put her big butt. I mean, put her on his shoulder <laughs> and push her up the rope, and then she comes sliding down her. Now that's a marriage retreat, oh, <laughs> Brittany wow. Jackson. That's a marriage retreat. See, uh, <laughs> wow, people ain't coming to my marriage retreats. So uh, <laughs> they might they're cracking up. But I enjoy, I really enjoy, we got to figure out a way to do something on a larger scale. Mm -hmm. um, we got to figure that out because we, we mm -hmm. have awesome marriage retreats together. And mm -hmm. uh, many people often, uh, we were over in D-Land, Florida and had a similar experience, but I love doing marriage retreats with you. I think we got to oh, figure out. Awesome. Something. Let's do it. Let's do it, Bishop. Yep. All right. We're almost there. We have uh, six minutes. Uh, number okay. five. The number, wait, one, two, three, four, five. One of my past friends said, Bishop, you got to get your numbers right. You can't count up to four. <laughs> okay, number five. Number five is hobbies. Tell us yes. what your hobby is and why. Uh, you know, I first of all, hobbies, I think, are so important. You know, vocation is our calling. Avocation is a calling away. Mm -hmm. uh, we need something to call us away. And, and that's what hobbies do. So, so golf is probably my my favorite hobby. Okay, is, is playing golf. And and the reason I play golf is because I love being out in nature, and um, I just love the exercise of walking the course. And you can always it seems like a new game every time you play it because it's a new course, it's a new scenery. It's new challenges. Mm. I can never get bored with golf. You understand? Um, treadmills, you know, it's a treadmill. You, you, you're running on the treadmill. You know, I agree with that. You know, uh, asphalt is asphalt. You maybe look at the trees and where you're running. But golf is a different game every time you play it. Basketball is a basketball court, okay? Um, so that's why I love playing golf. Cycling was an opportunity for me to see a lot of landscape in a short period of time. 
Yes. So I'm able to travel 30 miles of landscape and still get exercise. I can never, well, I wouldn't say never, but it, it, it would take me a long time to run or jog 30 miles True. versus riding and cycling 30 miles. And again, being out in nature, seeing the landscape, um, those are my my favorite hobbies, golf and cycling. And so you you actually cycle with a group of guys, the Jamaican fellas. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. And and so what, what, I mean, what? I mean, really, you're good. You know, if, if I told we, I said if we do it, if we do a triathlon, Garmin's gonna handle the uh, the cycling part. He got the cycling part down. Thirty yes, miles, y'all yes. go thirty miles. Thirty miles is is a typical. Um, I've been as far as sixty three miles on a cycling trip and and that was very tough um but it was it was one of the goals that i had i was actually doing a ride with again a mentor so i have a mentor in cycling Excellent. and he's a he's a member of my church and he used to cycle professionally so every time he goes out he does at least 70 miles every time he rides so um one day i rode with him i told him i was going to ride with him Good and job. Um, he he challenged me, so he pushed me those sixty three miles. But it's it's good when you're riding with people because you can yes. stop and you can fellowship, and um, it's just a wonderful time. All right, well I, I'm gonna take a golf of course just so I can hang out with you and keep up. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Okay, last one. I'm gonna combine number six and seven. Uh, okay, six is your entrepreneurial ideas and adventures that you're working on right now. And sure. then close it with finances to give us some wisdom on finances. Okay, entrepreneur, you know, I've always believed that we need at least four streams of income. Um, it was four rivers that watered the Garden of Eden. And one of my entrepreneur, um, of course, you know, working at the church, but one of my entrepreneur um, things that I do is real estate. Real estate is part of my um, plan, um, my generational plan. Um, these, these are homes that I plan to leave with my children and hopefully my children's children. So getting to real estate is a wonderful thing. Actually, that that is the first step to generational wealth is home ownership, Excellent. home ownership. So you know, I always tell leaders, make sure you start out before you invest in stocks and bonds, you know, get your home, stop renting and start owning, Excellent. stop Excellent. renting and start owning home ownership. Oh. Is the first step for generational wealth. Yes, sir. So um, real estate is one of my streams of income. And then, of course, the stock market. That's another stream of income. Um, with your finances, we just want to make sure that we um, live beneath our means. You know, that's where a lot of people get in trouble. They live above their means. So what I instruct people to do, um, try to live on 70% of your income. Live on 70% of your income. 10%, uh, of course, belongs to God. That's your tithe. 10% yeah. uh, for you and 10% for your future, your investments. Um, but learn to live on 70% of your income and always put your needs over your wants. Follow the now theory, N-O-W, needs over wants, needs over wants. I like that. Live beneath your means. And the third thing, get out of debt. Get out of yes, debt. Yes, Jesus. It's a structural evil. Um, to just steal, kill, and destroy. Mm. Um, so you want to get out of debt, be debt-free, invest in your future, and um, have multiple strings of income in your life. You know, a borrower is a slave to the lender. And, yes. Uh, I tell folk, when you owe them money, you ain't their friend no more. You a slave. And that's why they, <laughs> right. invite, that's why they don't invite you back to anything, because you don't bring slaves to the table. <laughs> <laughs> a mortgage is a death. More. That's where we get the word more from. And you're dying paying mortgage. <laughs> <In the morgue. laughs>
I know, I know. I heard there's an old Chinese proverb that says, uh, getting dead is like opening a faucet. Paying mm -hmm. it back is like getting water out of a pool using a teaspoon. <laughs> I oh, mean, it's something good. else. Well, well, Mr. Gar Dr. Garvey, it's a joy yeah. to have you with us. Um, yes. Would you share with me? Uh, we're getting ready to close. Uh, I, I'm mm -hmm. gonna go and give another plug about my book. I'm so thrilled. We got our book, y'all. Get the book mm -hmm. at death's door. Uh, get the book. Yes. I'm gonna plan at some point. I don't know. I told Maria. I said I need, I need to take two weeks off and like plan. Yes book tour and just go and just share the book and share the story because uh, the book is designed to uh, really encourage people to live. You you don't have to die even when you're at death's door. You can keep living. You can keep living. Dr. Garman, would you uh, tell the folk where your church is located uh, so if they decide to come to Atlanta, they can go there first. That's the only place to go in Atlanta. Go there and uh, maybe one other place, one other place. But go go to Dr. Yeah. God. I'm talking about Bishop Bronner. But go, you can go to Bishop Bronner. <laughs> but go to both of them. Go to both of those. Everything else, don't ask me about. Yes, so, yes. Um, what I'd like for you to do is tell us the name of your church, and then would you close us out in prayer? We're so thankful that you took the time. I know you have a busy schedule, but I am mm -hmm. so thankful that you've been able to share uh, to the hundreds of people uh, who yeah. are going to view this and are viewing it now. Um, just, just, just tell us about church and then close us out in prayer. Amen. Amen. Well, um, I've been at word of faith, love center, word of faith, love center in East point, Georgia, which is right outside of Atlanta, um, about 10 minutes away from the Atlanta airport, um, for 17 years, 17 years before that I was an executive and assistant pastor under Bishop Bronner at word of faith cathedral. So you can just go to the website, W O F lovecenter.org, W-O-F, lovecenter.org. And it's been a pleasure being with my bishop, my friend, my brother on this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, we love you. And I see the information of how to get a copy of the book. So I'm glad I'm going to amazon.com tonight. Oh, you can see it. Oh yeah, there it is. It is. I'm going to Amazon.com. Go to Amazon.com tonight and order this book at Death's Door. Um, and and Bishop Wade wrote it, but Elder Marie lived it. So yeah. uh, I'm sure it's anointed and appointed for such a time as this. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, let me pray. Father, Lord, we just thank you so much, oh God, just oh, for the God. leaders that are here today. I thank you for filling them with all the wisdom and understanding that they need in order to go to another level. I pray that you will bless their life, bless their ministry, bless their families, oh God. May you fill them with strategies yes. of how to win this world to you, God. I pray, Father, that you will take their personal growth and development to another level. Yes. Spend time with them, oh God. Fill them with your presence and allow the anointing of God to destroy yokes and move burdens. Lord, we pray for Bishop Wade and all that he's doing, oh Father, for leaders around the world. Give him, oh Lord, the grace to be able to do what you called him to do, Father. And we give you all glory on and praise yes. in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Amen. And amen. Amen. My brother, I love you. We appreciate you. you and uh, mm -hmm. we're thankful. Look forward to us seeing each other in the days coming forth. Sounds good. Thank you, Bishop. God bless. God bless you.